Father, thank you that you are the great and glorious God, the one who is sovereign over all things. And we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and the opportunity to, not just on Easter Sunday, but on every day to celebrate and live in the power of his resurrection. We're grateful for the gift of your word, and thank you for the opportunity to open it with these dear brothers and sisters. God, I pray that your spirit would do what I cannot do and take your words and press them deep upon our hearts to mold and shape us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus, so that he would receive praise and honor and we would experience deep and lasting joy. And we pray that in his name. Amen. Well, it is a privilege to be with you here this morning. Thank you to Dr. Allen and uh, all those who have played a part in bringing me here to visit uh, this fine institution. Uh, even though I'm not from the area, I'm well aware of of uh, hearing things that are going on here and, and really uh, have come to, uh, to know that God is actively doing some very exciting things here at Midwestern. So it's a privilege to come in and just get to experience a piece of that today. Um, seminary is an interesting season of life, as you no doubt understand, and people's experience of that can look different depending on life stages and circumstances, etc. So I began uh, serving, uh, or I began seminary after serving on staff with Campus Crusade for about five years. So at that point, I was married. I had one son, and about a year into seminary, had our second son. So I went through seminary trying to be faithful to all those different responsibilities of being a husband, a father, a provider, a member of a local church, and most importantly, a follower of Jesus. And even if your life circumstances are a little bit different than what I've described, I'm confident that you often wrestle with the reality of what does it look like to be faithful in all those different areas of life that God has uh, given you responsibilities in. Now, I would say that one consistent experience of seminary students, whether you're in a master's or a doctoral program, is at some level beginning to dream about how God might use you on the other end of your seminary education. And for some of you, that might mean being a senior pastor. Others of you may be thinking about the mission field, being a church planter, being a counselor, or maybe if you're especially uh, interested in self-inflicted pain, going on for doctoral work. And those of you who are in a doctoral program understand what I'm talking about. But even in your situation, you're probably dreaming at some level about what it would be like to finish your program and then get a teaching position somewhere. And uh, regardless of the specifics, it's natural for us to, to dream a little bit about what the Lord might have for us on the other side of seminary. Now, when I entered seminary, I dreamed of being a systematic theologian. I thought that was the path that God had for me. And then I was introduced to Jonathan Edwards in a church history class. And I thought, now that's the ticket. I'm going to be a historical theologian. But over time, it became clear to me that my true and ultimate passion was getting into the word and exegeting it, explaining it, and trying to teach it to others. So God took me down the path of being a New Testament professor and uh, working in the areas of New Testament and biblical theology. But I think one of the subtle dangers that's universal across the seminary experience is this danger that comes as we're preparing, and it's this. There can be the temptation to begin to think about ministry as if it's all about us and our abilities. And so maybe we see the ministry success of various people that we look up to, and we subtly begin to want the same thing. So we begin to daydream about what it would be like to lead a really large church, or to be the guy that comes in and revitalizes a struggling or dying church and turns it around. 
Or maybe we, we, tend to, we start to dream about what would it be like to grow my own platform or to, to write books or to speak at conferences, to, to be invited to speak at T4G or to do a breakout session at the Gospel Coalition Conference. And we think about what it might be like to subtly make a name for ourselves. But the question I want us to look at this morning is, what does God think of that desire to make a name for ourselves? The passage we're going to look at, I believe, will answer that question for us. Join me in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And as you're turning there, we need to situate it in the context of Genesis 1 through 11. So, you remember in Genesis 1 through 3, God creates Adam and he places him in the garden. He he creates Adam in his own image to rule over creation as a king and to mediate God's presence to creation around him. God commissions Adam to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it under God's own ultimate authority. And he even provides every plant as food. But as we well know, Adam fails in this commission. He rebels against God and opens the door for sin and death to enter into creation. And as a result, judgment follows. Yet even in the judgment that God announces in Genesis 3, there's this glimmer of hope that God says a serpent crusher from the line of Eve will obey where Adam failed and take upon himself the punishment for Adam's sin. So then as death, uh, sin and death spread throughout creation, things become so bad that God decides to bring judgment through the flood. And as you read through the story of the flood, it is as if God is decreating. He's undoing what he did at creation in order to bring judgment, saving just Noah and his family. So when Noah emerges from the ark in Genesis 9, God issues to Noah a modified version of that commission to Adam. He tells him to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And he provides food as well. In essence, Noah is being presented as almost an Adam 2.0. He's the next version. So the question as you're reading through Genesis maybe for the first time should be, how is this Adam going to fare? How are his descendants going to fare in comparison to the original Adam? Spoiler alert, not well. But we'll see that here in Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. We'll go through verse 9, and we'll take the story here in little chunks. Maybe we'll call them scenes. So in verses 1 through 2, we will see the setting. So I invite you to follow along in your Bibles as I read Genesis chapter 11. Verses 1 through 2. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So at this point, no indication of how long it's been after the flood. But if you dig into the details here in Genesis, what becomes apparent is actually this event happens before the series of genealogies in chapter 10 to help us understand how we got to the various populations, the different nations that are listed in Genesis 10. At this point, though, they still speak the same language, even the same words as the ESV puts it, and the whole earth at this point consists of descendants from Noah's line. There's an interesting little feature here. When you look at verse Two, as people migrated from the east, or it could also be translated towards the east, up to this point in Genesis, anytime there's movement east, it's movement away from God. It's movement away from God's presence. So after Cain is exiled, he moves, he settles east of Eden, away from the garden. And so you have this, this movement in Genesis that eastward is away from God. So there's a first little subtle hint that maybe not everything is as innocent as it might seem on the surface. And as they're traveling along, they find this plain in the land of Shinar, which is probably in modern-day Iraq. 
And we can imagine that the area must have been attractive in many respects for perhaps agriculture or uh, for grazing livestock. And so they decided, they decided to settle down and just ease into life in this one location. Now, in and of itself, that seems innocent. But as we'll see, the larger context gives us hints that there is nothing innocent about this desire to settle here in this location. So that brings us to scene number two, the human word. Look with me at verses three and four. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So now we have in verse 3 the first speech in the story. And after noting their preferences for construction materials, the builders state their intention to build a city and a tower. Now, I want you to look carefully, though, at how they express that desire. First, they say, let us make bricks. And then let us burn them thoroughly. And then let us build ourselves a city. And let us build a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. Now, in the context of Genesis, we've heard that language before. We heard it back in Genesis 1. Let us make man in our own image. So do you hear what these human builders are doing? They are speaking in an almost God-like fashion. They are taking upon themselves an almost God-like posture of, let us do this. Let us make a city and a tower. So this is no innocent sort of building plan. There's much more going on here. Now, I should point out, there's nothing inherently wrong with building a city. In fact, the Bible ends with the setting in a city, the new Jerusalem. So it's not like God is anti-urban and all about the rural. It's more about what that city represents. Generally speaking, in the ancient world at this point, cities did not tend to be as much a place where you lived as much as a place where you gathered for worship. And this tower is no innocent, say, Sears Tower in Chicago or just some innocent skyscraper that we're supposed to look at and go, wow, that's really nice. As best we can tell, in the most likely understanding of what this tower was, was an ancient ziggurat, meaning this was a tower that was built with staircases that was supposed to go up into the heavens and served as a mediating point where the gods could come down and interact with humanity, and humanity could go up and ascend and interact with the gods. That's why it's mentioned there at the end, or there in verse 4, when it says, a tower with its top in the heavens. So this is no mere innocent skyscraper. This is an expression of idolatry. But that's not all. Did you notice what the ultimate purpose of the city was here in verse 4? It's at the very end of verse 4. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So positively, let's make a name for ourselves. Negatively, let's not be scattered over all the face of the earth. So their goal in making this tower in this city was that for generations to come, people would see that city and see that tower and marvel at the wisdom and the creativity and the skill and, the, and just the sheer ability of these builders. It was a monument to their own greatness. And negatively, they're saying, we don't want to be scattered. But here again is where a contextual understanding of what's going on helps you see how rebellious that is. Remember, back in chapter 9, verse 1, when Noah gets out of the ark, what does God say to him? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And now they're saying, 
eh, no thanks. We all want to stay right here. So this composite picture is one of idolatry and rebellion against God's purposes. So far, the descendants of Adam 2.0 are not exactly doing any better than their predecessor. So at this stage, when you got through verse 4, there's this burning question. You notice there's one character who has not shown up in the story yet. God. Let's see what happens when he does. Scene 3, verses 5 through 7. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So for the first time, we get Yahweh's perspective on things. And it is not what the builders might have hoped for, right? Just like when God confronts Adam and Eve for their sin, Yahweh descends to investigate what's going on here. And there's a link between Adam and what is taking place that is especially apparent, I think, in the Hebrew text. So at the end there of verse uh, 5, when it says, uh, to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. In Hebrew, that's B'nai Ha'adam, the sons of the Adam had built. Now I know Adam can be a generic reference to human beings, I get that. But I think the author here, Moses, is giving us another hint to say they are falling into the same rebellion that the original Adam himself did. The offspring of Adam 2.0 aren't faring any better than Adam 1.0. Now, did you catch the irony here? This is one of my favorite parts of the story. Remember, the builders are thinking, we're going to build this tower, and it's going to be so high into the heavens, it's as if it's going to bump God in the face. It's so high. And the text says, did you notice this? It says in verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. The impression is almost as if, and I know this is a bit of hyperbole, but it's almost as if God is like, huh, what's that? I think that might be a tower. I should go all the way down there and see what that little puny thing is. They think it's this great thing. God's like, huh, that's a really small, puny-looking tower. I should probably go down all the way and check it out. So what is Yahweh's assessment of the city and the tower? Verses 6 and 7 tell us, as these sons of the Adam are united in their language, there is seemingly no limit to their potential wickedness. They have united together to make a name for themselves, and as a result, it's as if God's purpose of redemption, of filling the earth, of bringing the serpent crusher, is in jeopardy, and God will not sit idly by. So what does he do? Verse 7, come let us go down and confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. Did you hear the parallels? It's as if God is saying to the builders, I see your come let us and I'll raise you a couple. Let us go down and confuse their languages. God will not permit his redemptive purposes to be thwarted. And yet, just like with the, within the garden, even in the midst of judgment, there's notes of hope. You see, the text makes it, makes it at least indirectly clear that if God does not intervene here, nothing that sinful, wicked humanity proposes to do will be left in check. And so it's an incredible act of mercy 
that God scatters the people because he is putting a check on human rebellion. So now all that's left in the story is to look at the final scene, verses 8 and 9. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, maybe use your sanctified imagination here to picture what that must have been like to come to work the next day and instead of understanding everyone around you, all you're hearing is the confusion and mixture of different languages that you have no idea what they are. I think many of us have probably been in foreign contexts where no one around you maybe speaks English and all you hear is language and it sounds to you like almost gibberish perhaps because you don't understand it and maybe if you've been in that situation you can feel a little bit unsettled like i can't communicate with anyone how do i how do i get around how do i navigate life in this context where no one speaks my language so you can imagine the frustration the anger and eventually over time they begin to group off together with people that they can't understand and next thing you know they stop building the tower in the city and they are scattered Now, one of the ironies in this story is, remember, these builders set out to make a name for themselves. So what does God do? He says, okay, I will give you a name. It's just not the name that you were hoping for. You see, instead of it becoming a memorial to God's, or to these human builders' uh, prowess and abilities and wisdom, it becomes a monument to, of God's judgment. And as a result, the name Babel comes from this context. The Hebrew verb has the meaning of confuse or mix. And there's even a sense today when we hear that term, someone is babbling on, it's as if we are giving our own testimony to the roots of that, of the confusion of the languages. So despite the best efforts of the sons of Adam to thwart God's purpose of filling the earth and multiplying, and despite their best efforts to worship on their own terms, despite their best efforts to make a glorious name for themselves that would be remembered for generations, God simply acts and it's undone. So then what does God think of this desire to make a name for themselves, for ourselves? The simple answer is, God hates it, and he opposes it. He hates it, and he opposes it. But one question the text does not answer directly is, why? It tells us that he opposes this effort, he hates this effort, but this passage, Genesis 11, 1 through 9, doesn't tell us why. To get the answer to that question, you have to move out into the context. And so as you sort of skim over the rest of Genesis 11, you get one of these Toledotes, these generations, these genealogies. And actually you get two of them, and they culminate by introducing a man named Abram at the end of chapter 11. And then, of course, you get this staggering promise in Genesis 12 that God makes to Abram. It is the foundation, it is the substructure of the entire Old Testament. And even Paul himself in Galatians argues that there's a sense in which it's the substructure of the entire biblical narrative in one respect. But there's an element of this that I think we often miss when we read it. So look with me at Genesis chapter 12, embedded here in verse 2. God promises to Abram, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. So, did you catch it? You see, the sons of Adam wanted to make a name for themselves by building a city and a tower. God promises to make Abram's name great, and through him to bless all the nations. 
So at least part of the answer to why God opposes our efforts to make our own name great is because God alone reserves the right to make a name great. But there's even more going on here as you sort of trace out this thread through the biblical story. You see, as God's plan unfolds into the Old Testament and develops through Abraham and his descendants and the nation of Israel and all the way down to a man named David, as part of what God promises to David in 2 Samuel 7, he says this, I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. So God is saying this promise of a name to be made great is going to come through a descendant of David. And this descendant of David is going to build a house for Yahweh's name and rule over an eternal kingdom. And then centuries later, the prophet Zephaniah taps into a similar promise when he says in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. So in the centuries that follow, that hope remains unfulfilled until Jesus steps onto the stage. He is the singular seed of Abraham who receives the inheritance that God had promised to Abraham. He's the son of David who rules over that eternal kingdom and builds his people into a house for Yahweh's name. And no wonder he is able to do that because as Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 tells us, God has, exa- has highly exalted him And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here at last is the great name that God says. That's the name I'm making great. And there is a day coming, friends, when every knee will bow to that great name. And for those of us who love Jesus and have surrendered to him as our great king and put our trust in him, that day will be of unspeakable joy and celebration. Greater than any victory party for an athletic team you'll ever see. Greater than any presidential inauguration you can ever imagine. Greater than any movie scene that depicts the celebration of a great enthronement of a king. It will be so beyond our ability to imagine that it will stir us with love and joy unspeakable. But for those who don't know Jesus, they too will bow that knee and it will be out of utter terror that the king is back and he is bringing judgment. So this idea of God having a name that he is making great and of of nations coming together and gathering around that one great name. We've already seen an advanced preview of this. It's at Pentecost. Think about what happens in Acts 2, right? The Spirit descends. The apostles go out in the temple courts, and they are proclaiming the mighty acts of God in the temple courts. And people from different languages are in Jerusalem celebrating, and they are hearing the mighty acts of God being declared. And what do they do? They put their trust in the one who has the great name. And they are united around worship of the great name, Jesus Christ. And all of that was in anticipation of the scene described in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. The apostle John has given this glimpse into heaven, and this is what he sees, Revelation 7, verses 9 through 10. After this, I looked, and behold... A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the goal towards which God is driving all of human history. 
people from every tribe, every tongue, every language, united together around the worship of the one who has the great name, Jesus Christ. So why does God oppose our efforts to make a name for ourselves? Because there's only one name that God has determined to make great, and it's the name of his son, Jesus. So how should we respond to God's word this morning? As those of us who are serving in various forms of ministry and just in general in the Christian life, we face the constant temptation to make a name for ourselves. Now it can show up in seemingly small ways. Maybe you raise your hand in class to make a comment to draw attention to your own insight and your own wisdom. Maybe you subtly turn conversations back towards yourself and your own experiences. Maybe you post something on Twitter with a desire to get tons of likes and retweets, etc. Maybe you tell a story in a sermon to make yourself look good. Or maybe you drop in some Greek and Hebrew or quotes from famous preachers like Calvin and Spurgeon to demonstrate your own intellect and your own abilities to make people look at you and say, wow, he is gifted. Maybe you write a journal article or a book to try to get your name out there and and draw attention to yourself so that people will be impressed by you and want to hear what you think on certain subjects. There are infinitely subtle ways that we can be tempted to make a name for ourselves. And the question is, do we really want to put ourselves in a position where we're inviting God to oppose us. So, how do we fight against this? Well, at one level, we play defense. We make sure we have people in our lives who can call us out on that. That We are in good Christian community in our churches and in other contexts with a spouse and friends. People who are in our lives and can and speak to us and call us out when that happens. But I'm convinced it's not enough to play defense. We have to go on the offensive against this temptation to make a name for ourselves. And I'm convinced that deep and lasting change in this area will only come when we understand and believe that Jesus Christ has the name above every name. You see, when the eyes of our hearts see and grasp Jesus as the serpent crusher who obeyed where Adam failed, as the seed of Abraham who receives the promises that God made to him, as the prophet greater than Moses who led us in a second exodus, as the conqueror greater than Joshua who brings us into the new creation, as the king greater than David who defeats our greatest enemies of sin, death, and the devil, as the wise man greater than Solomon who is God's wisdom in human form, as the one who is the light to the nations that Israel could never be, as the suffering servant who took upon him himself our sin as the one greater than Jonah who spent three days in the grave and rose to new life as the one who inaugurates the promised new covenant as the one who pours out his spirit on his people and as the one who will one day return in glory to consummate his promises when we get that at the heart level we will no longer be interested in making our own name great When we see Jesus for who he is and as glorious as he is, our hearts will no longer crave after our own names being made great, but will ultimately be yearning for making the name of Jesus great. And here's the the deeper richness of this reality. We will experience far greater and more satisfying joy in making the name of Jesus great than we will ever experience in making our own names great. Brothers and sisters, no matter what God has called you to, no matter where he is taking you, in your context, in your families, in your workplace, in ministry, in your community, and in this world, let us ask God to give us a fresh love and devotion to Jesus to make his name great and a greater spirit-empowered resolve to take tangible steps to make that great name known to all around us.
Let's pray. Lord, you are the great and awesome one. And even the words that I've attempted to share this morning are inadequate to capture the beauty of the name of Jesus. Lord, forgive us for wanting to make our own names great and stir within us a fresh love for Jesus, a fresh taste of his beauty that would indeed motivate us to make his name great and make it known to all around us and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And we pray that for his glory and for our joy. Amen.